The bosses of the Donkey Kong Country series have been surprisingly memorable over the generations. They're so memorable, in fact, that a lot of fans have been requesting the return of the Kremlings after they've been gone from the recent games. Hyrule was already popular, but he only really blew up after he was missing from Donkey Kong Country Returns and replaced with the Dikis. Absence makes the heart grow fonder and all that. While bosses might not be the primary focus in platformers, they still provide an important climax at the end of the levels, making them either stick out as the most memorable part, or providing a big anti-climax at the end in case of some of the other lackluster bosses. I'm gonna be taking a look at how they all stack up against each other. Donkey Kong has had a very hit and miss track record with its bosses. That's part of why when there's misses, there's such a big reaction in the first place. DK has had its fair share of experimental and rocky phases throughout his career. And I'm not gonna shy away from that on this list. This is gonna include every mainline DK game, so no arcade DK, no Mario vs. DK, and no racing games, nothing like that. Aside from the final boss, Donkey Kong Country 1 is not exactly the best for bosses, as it reused several of them. It's still a great game and all, but parts of it were rushed due to lower development time than they wanted. One of the parts of that was the final world, some of it was the reused bosses. That's basically what I can gather from the interviews. It most directly shows with the reused bosses, obviously, since Very Naughty and Really Naughty are just recolors of each other. The only real difference between the two is that Really Naughty can just jump higher up in the air. But that's a pretty disappointing boss for what, in my opinion, is the hardest world in the game with Gorilla Glacier, the ice world. Even ignoring the reused aspect of the boss, it's just a glorified Goomba who slowly jumps back and forth across the screen. His design is an upscaled version of the game's Goomba, the Naughty. It's a first boss and all, but this is insultingly simple even by first boss standards. I looked to see if the infamous Dark Side Phil could possibly have trouble with this boss, and despite somehow managing to get hit, he still won on the first try. The Game Boy Advance remake of the game does at least add some more complication to the second form of the boss, really naughty, by adding falling rocks. This is more of a band-aid fix because they have to keep the original boss due to being a remake, but it's nice there was at least some attempt to spice things up. In the GBA version, there's actually some dialogue after each boss, and even Cranky pox the fact that the boss is a reused recolor. Master Neki is the other reused boss. He is slightly more complicated than Naughty in that you have to go high up in the air to hit him. And you can sometimes get caught out by the wonky hitboxes from his nuts, which makes it vaguely possible to lose to him. Still, the fact that this guy only has his head drawn out is the obvious attempt to save on art assets by the developers. The recolored version has almost no differences whatsoever beyond a different color palette, and the developers turning up the numbers on how fast his projectiles go. The first one of these bosses has his arena named Neki's Nuts which is one of Rare's attempts at adult humor, which I would say doesn't age quite so well. It's pretty pathetic that Master Neki Sr. is technically the boss of the final world. Thank goodness the game closes on K. Rule rather than him. Can you imagine how dumb it'd be if it just ended on Master Neki Sr.? Somehow, it's just a hunch, but I don't think Master Neki Sr. for Smash would have taken off. The GBA remake of the game actually adds some more complication to the boss by making you fight both Master Neki Sr. and Junior at the same time. I'd say that's a good bit better than just adding some random falling rocks to the boss. Cranky of course is here too, and his dialogue on the fight is still funny as ever. Don't let the transition to 3D fool you. This boss really isn't any more complicated than something like the Neki family. You casually move left and right to dodge the projectiles of the boss with no hope of him ever hitting you, and then you throw the TNT at him as he lets you attack him for no real reason. It's also possible to argue this is the easiest boss in Donkey Kong history because of the fact you have such a gigantic HP bar and the boss only takes one hit out of it per attack. In the country games, you only get two hits, 
whereas you can be hit by the ridiculously easy to avoid attacks of this boss up to seven times and still win this pathetic fight. I think they were still trying to make these early bosses so easy because everyone was still getting used to the transition to 3D. The point of the boss is that they modeled a large dragon creature that's supposed to look impressive and everything, and for N64 graphics it does look pretty nice, but so does everything else in Donkey Kong 64. The design of the boss is still too simple for me to give it any points to put it higher on the list though. I mean, it's a generic dragon, come on. This is the first of many, many bosses from the peg swinging games from King of Swing and Jungle Climber. In these games, you can't just move about freely. You grab onto pegs and rotate around them before you go up flying in the direction you're facing when you release the button. This is a very frustrating control system based on Clue Clue Land. You primarily use the R and L buttons to control yourself in these games. They're really weird. Kongazuma, in particular, just generically moves towards you. In concept, he's no more complicated than very naughty. However, it's possible for him to kill you just because a player's still getting used to the terrible controls in this game, where they might throw themselves into him because of the game's frustrating mechanics. Besides the controls, another terrible thing about King of Swing specifically is the banana system. You can grind bananas infinitely as much as you want in the levels, and use them on the bosses to instantly regain health or become invincible. This can make the bosses theoretically even easier than very naughty, Dogadon, whoever else you want to compare to, even with the controls. But for Kongazuma specifically, they're not gonna grind the bananas out on such an easy first boss, so it doesn't really apply to him so much as the other bosses in the game. This is a boss most people don't even remember exists from Donkey Kong 64. This is a mini-boss fought in Fungi Forest for a Golden Banana, not one of the main bosses you fight for a boss key. While a lot of effort was put into animating this large spider, his attacks are really simple, so it's kind of put to waste. He summons minions to attack you, which function as standard issue Goombas, and he vomits at you. That's all he does. His vomit slows the player down and makes it harder to move, making them more likely to get hit, but it deals no damage out of the player's 8 HP watermelon bar. Would it really be so unreasonable to apply this slowing effect and hurt the player in the process? Sheesh. The spider boss is sleeping up above the arena for most of the fight, and only wakes up when he's allowed to be hit, which the player can do by shooting him in the eye. He doesn't do anything to attack the player while he's awake, he just looks around, making himself vulnerable, which is pretty dumb. This is the only time the boss is vulnerable, you see, because his eyelid is made out of titanium, and Tiny Kong's projectiles could not possibly pierce it. While this boss is still super easy, it's at least more creative than just generically jumping on the boss's head. You throw the eggs, Crow drops back at him to damage him. He has a significantly more creative design for a Neki boss than Master Neki, and he actually has his entire body drawn out, so that's a nice improvement. There's been some confusion over Crow being a chick because he drops eggs as his main method of attack but the manual refers to him as a guy. You have to wonder if he's killing his own children to use his ammunition, or if he's just kidnapping the children of others for his attacks or something. Regardless of this boss having a lot more visual polish than the DKC1 bosses, the fact the boss is so simple and easy means it still gets a low ranking. The only real way I can see it being possible for someone to get hit here is if they're rushing and don't know when the egg stops being a hitbox and starts becoming an object that the player can pick up and throw. This is pretty much the exact same fight as Dogadon. Dodges fireballs and throws the TNT at the boss. Both the TNT and the fireballs use the exact same art assets as Dogadon, for Pete's sake. Army Dillo throws in an attack where he rolls at you, so he's technically more complicated than Dogadon despite being the first boss, but he rolls so slowly, it just wastes time. I'd rather he just didn't even have it. It's not like anybody's ever gonna get hit by that. Army Dillo has a significantly more creative design than the generic dragon that is Dogadon. Having cannons come out of your armor 
Armored Shell is legitimately pretty cool. He's basically an Armadillo Blastoise. I'd say that's enough to make him better than generic Dragon Boss, even if he's functionally the same. It's worth bringing up that the harder versions of Armadillo and Dogadon were the ones originally made by developers. In the demo cart footage here, you can see Armadillo using his other attacks in the first arena. To make the easier versions of the bosses, they just took the bosses they'd already made, stripped them of over half their attacks, and called it a day. As a player, you might think they added attacks to the boss, but once you understand how the development cycle goes, this is really just as lazy as stuff like Very Naughty. Another gimmick game rears its head here with Donkey Kong Jungle Beat. Jungle Beat has 18 bosses in it, but only 5 unique bosses. The other 13 are all recolors with slight differences. The amount of reused bosses puts even DKC1 to shame, and this game had 10 years and massive technological improvements to close the gap. Unlike the peg-swinging games made by Pan, Jungle Beat has absolutely no DK characters other than DK. K. Rule makes no appearance in the game. This footage here? Yeah, this guy's the final boss. Despite having a recolor of himself with a different name, both Cactus King and Ghastly King are the same character in Japan. At least he gets to be his own character despite the fact he's fought twice, not that the game has any plot to speak of anyway. The bosses of Jungle Beat are all extremely simplistic because of the very limited control scheme, meaning they look super generic if you're watching them. For his first fight, the only real attack the boss has once you kill his pig mount, which takes all of two seconds, is generically kicking at you and touching you. You'd think with his extremely top-heavy design, he might use his arms to attack, but no, his arms are just for show. In his rematch, he can kick in mid-air and vomit projectiles at you, but the most threatening thing he does is still walking at you menacingly. The final boss's primary attack being the same as Very Naughty's isn't high praise. The only thing even slightly cool about this guy anyway is the pig mount. Too bad it dies so quickly. Almost all of his attacks and difficulty are locked behind the second time you fight him. The credits still roll after defeating him the first time, though, which makes that a pretty big anti-climax if I've ever seen one. When you're fighting him for the second time, you're gonna be too focused on the fact that even the final boss of the game is not immune to having a recolor to bother appreciating his new attacks. The first form of the boss really should have just been removed. The developers of Jungle Beat would go on to make the far better title of Super Mario Galaxy. Cactus King is so generic that his model is left inside of Galaxy as an unused file called Black Mist Creature. They changed his model's file name in Galaxy's files, so it implies they might have legitimately been planning to use him. Who knows? Maybe Cactus King could make the cut as a generic enemy. That's certainly what he deserves. Seeing a K. Rule appearance this far down the list may seem blasphemous, but this is proof that not every game K. Rule is in is automatically good. K. Rule is very generic in this game, stealing medals for a contest from DK, and he chases him across the world to get them back. I know the plots of the other Donkey Kong games aren't exactly Shakespearean, but the other games at least have some stakes with K. Rule either trying to starve the Kongs, kidnap them, or blow up their island. As for the boss fight, itself, they took a legendary villain character like K. Rule and used him as an excuse to showcase multiplayer features. The multiplayer was already designed as an extra mode outside of the main game, so this was an excuse for them to just throw it into the campaign. You start with a race against K. Rule, and unless you can do frame-perfect inputs to climb as quickly as possible, it mostly just seems like luck from my experience. K. Rule will sometimes just throw the match and be slower sometimes, I don't know why. You basically just keep rematching him over and over until he screws up. The next phase is less terrible, but it's just hard to take the challenge seriously when you have infinite bananas to restore your health. This boss is much easier than the very difficult levels that came before it, so the vast majority of players will have already grinded a lot of bananas. K. Rule plays by mostly the same rules as DK as he launches himself across the pegs to attack, where you just hit him when he's vulnerable. The first phase is the more difficult part, the direct fight against him is one of the easier boss fights in this game, if anything. 
This is the other DK64 mini boss. It starts out as a few enemies coming out of a toy chest in an enemy barrage style fight, similar to Boss Dumb Drum, but much easier and more dull. After that, several more toys will come out of the chest and combine to form a giant toy monster. Chunky Kong can go into the Hunky Chunky barrel to become giant as well, then easily beat up on it. It's a nice cinematic effect, but that's all it is. It's hard to even pretend it's a real boss fight. The giant toy golem has a single, very slow attack where he swings his arm at you, and touching him doesn't hurt you. This boss suffers from the giant DK64 health bar problem like all the other ones, but if the fight wasn't easy enough, the first five Goombas during the enemy rush each drop watermelon pickups to restore your health. The only slightly difficult thing about this fight is the terrible hitbox of the boss. Despite his giant model, the toy golem has a very tiny and specific hitbox, and a generous amount of invincibility after he gets hit before he can be hit again. A player might try to punch the boss several times, like the Dogadon boss fight with Chunky, only to get slapped in the face as nothing happens. The only way the boss might have a chance to defeat Chunky is if he just sat there mindlessly trading hits with it. While the boss will rarely attack unprompted, it seems to like to counter Chunky's attack with his own, meaning it can at least be slightly tricky to get out of the fight with no damage. Just more than can be said for Dogadon and Army Demo. The visual design of the boss is also at least somewhat creative, at least more so than a generic large spider or dragon. This is probably the hardest boss that I'm going to put this low. The boss generically moves towards you, and it's too large to go around. It's his main attack, he just generically goes towards you, and it's really hard to avoid it. He occasionally shoots out fireballs, which will cool off and become rocks that you can throw back at him to damage him. It sounds simple, this generic cliche of throwing the boss's projectiles back at him, but it's quite frustrating to get into position to fight the boss properly and throw the rocks before he into you. You pretty much either have to do this boss perfectly or you lose. There's very little room for failure. This is only the second boss, so your levels to choose from to grind bananas are pretty slim, so it's not like you can fall back on those either. Technically, you might be able to avoid him if you really wanted to by just constantly going across the pegs, but the boss is so big, even if you were specifically trying to do that, it would be hard, and all of the rocks generally show up at the bottom, so you don't really have much choice you have to be down there. He's going to ram you unless you kill him. Boss is over really quickly. Either he kills you or you kill him and you do it perfectly. Of the four Jungle Beat bosses that repeat four times, this one is the most underwhelming of all. This is just another generic giant bird, but repeated four times. For some reason, attacking the large egg the bird is carrying hurts it and eventually kills it. I get that the bird wants to protect their egg, but just take it away to safety before coming back to fight DK. Apparently, if the bird bothered to leave its egg back in its nest, it would be impervious to attack. Like, I don't get the logic of that at all. The first of these four bosses barely makes much effort to even attack DK. Jungle Beat also features a gigantic health system similar to King of Swing, because the developers knew the controls were too terrible to expect the players to avoid all the hits, so they gave them that big old HP bar. Now we don't have to worry about the hits being too hard to avoid, because they can take so many it doesn't matter. With the three harder versions of this bird boss, it doesn't really even gain that many new attacks, it just fires projectiles in higher quantities and flies faster by comparison to the previous encounters. The main thing that changes is just the arena, while the boss itself it doesn't really change. The final version has some notable differences, with DK having to launch himself throughout the air to get to the boss boss, but that more so adds the time to defeat the boss than any real risk of the player actually losing to it. Oh look, it's another Jungle Beat boss repeated four times. These pigs throw fruit at you that's electrified, you use a sound wave to make it safe to grab, you throw it back, repeat, we've already seen this for a fair few bosses already on the list. The first version of this boss barely does anything but that really super basic attack pattern, making him probably the worst Jungle Beat boss on his own, that's a pretty highly contested title, but I'm not going to rank every single one of these recolors individually, that's too much. As for the 
other pigs, they mostly are differentiated by the stage changing like the birds. They do get faster and throw more projectiles, but that's really about it. They eventually gain the ability to attack you in melee range, but no player would realistically be next to the pigs when they're not stunned and vulnerable to attack. The only real reason I think these are better than the bird bosses is because they have a better design and because their theme is actually pretty good. This is DK Jungle Climber, the other peg-swinging game on a handheld. There are four Kremlin underling bosses created by K. Rool and Jungle Climber. K. Rool gives one of four critters a crystal banana, and they somehow transform into these random bosses or gain some other sort of weird powers. You can still see the spirits of the critters inside of the bosses when they become vulnerable, which makes it confusing as to what the heck's happening to them. Mega Amp is a giant robot that's fought twice, once in its incomplete state and once when it's finished. Two separate critters somehow transform into this boss in varying states of repair, which doesn't make much sense. Does the robot already exist and they're just possessing it or something? There are a few arbitrary weak points on the robot you have to open up and attack to defeat it. The second version of the boss adds more moving parts that attack and more weak points to hit. Regardless of which version you're fighting though, the hardest part of the boss is the final phase where the critter's soul is revealed at the top of the mech, which DK has to charge into for the final hit. Critter just throws around spiky balls and random patterns which can be very obnoxious to avoid in tandem with the mech's other attacks, especially in the rematch. If the Kremlin generically attacking is so powerful, why did it even become a mech in the first place? This boss goes low than most of the other jungle climber bosses for being too difficult to work with in the control scheme. A lot of people will just choose to cheese it by popping a crystal star during the final phase to gain free flight and invincibility. Normally being hard is a good thing, but not with this control scheme. This is K. Rool's other subpar appearance in the other peg swinging game. The first phase is nothing to write home about and is basically the same as the last phase of the K. Rool fight from King Swing. However, the new second phase is the real boss battle and adds some legitimate flash by turning K. Rool into a giant fire breathing version of himself. Many people have used this to say K. Rool is generic back when K. Rool was a smash candidate, and I can't really blame them, he does look like a pretty cookie cutter villain here. Remember when it was said that K. Rool would be a Bowser clone? Kremlin Claw, Downward Thrust, Bad Breath, Whirling Galleon. What a classic. I also really can't say I'm a fan of how the DS's dual screen mechanic makes K. Rool's proportions look way more inflated than they should be. Fat, ugly villains are fine and all, but he looks a bit unappealingly ugly compared to his usual self in this particular instance. The boss fight itself is much harder than it looks because it's a peg swing game. By comparison to the other hard boss from this game, Mega Amp, the boss at least has a few different attack patterns to choose from rather than clogging the screen with a billion projectiles and attacks at once. The attacks have to be avoided in unique ways with minimal gaps for DK to fit through. It's mostly just weird to see K. Rule summoning pegs for DK to use. They look tacky and out of place to me. Mega Amp did this particular aspect better, with giving specific points on the mech for DK to climb up that make aesthetic sense, rather than abstract targets floating in midair or appearing out of nothing. This boss is much harder to do if you ever lose Diddy Kong, since you can no longer launch him up at K. Rool for an easy hit, and instead have to climb all the way up to attack him. This only adds to the difficulty and frustration, as intelligent players will just kill themselves to get Diddy back for another attempt. While K. Rool showed up in a couple of games after this one and would eventually make it into Smash to defend the band. This is the last boss battle he's had since 2007, making it 14 years since he's had a new one. This is a really poor note to go out on for such an iconic villain, so here's hoping he can make a comeback in a future DK title. While this is far from the lowest ranked boss on the list, this one is my personal most hated. Donkey Kong Country Returns is notorious for its lackbuster enemies and bosses which replace the Kremlings. While the Tikis are the main antagonists to the game, the bosses are random animals the Tikis mind control with their hypnosis, with only the final boss being an actual Tiki himself. All that taken into account, I find it really weird that this boss in particular is a cartoon chicken piloting a mech. Why do you need to hypnotize a chicken to target a mech? Couldn't the Tiki just cut out the middleman and use the 
connect directly. The other thing I don't like about this boss thematically is the intro scene. We see that the Tikis are made in the factory, meaning they're essentially mindless drone robots. That goes against the theme of magical Tikis to me and just comes across making these forgettable antagonists all the more bland. Now, as for the actual boss battle itself, that's still very bad too. Colonel Pluck ever, ever so slowly waddles across the screen from side to side with his big robots. You're waiting for ages in order for him to do anything either remotely threatening or to give you a chance to attack him. The main way you will screw up in this battle is just from impatience and boredom. If you manage to fail in your chance to hit him, you have to wait through the entire phase of the fight just to get another opportunity. You might think that wouldn't happen, but I've had issues with this game's awful waggle controls, which are required to do that punching motion, which damages the underside of Pluck's mech. The 3DS version of the game doesn't have any terrible waggle controls, so I'd really recommend that version of the game if it's available to you. Pluck eventually gets a second phase to his boss fight to try to vary it up from running under his legs over and over, where he's hovering around in something resembling Eggman's egg bog. However, this phase is much, much easier and faster, and I've never seen anyone have any trouble with it. 99% of the fight is just waiting for him to walk back and forth and going under his legs. Why is this the second phase of the boss in the first place? It's just kind of tacked on. This DKC1 boss doesn't have a recolor like Very Naughty or Master Neki, so surely that means it's good, right? It's better, yeah, but it's just another upscaled enemy boss. Queen Bee is basically just a flying version of Really Naughty. You run away from the boss when it's red and throw barrels at it when it's not. This is about as bare bones as it gets and was definitely made on low budget. All you can say in defense of this boss is that it at least zooms around the screen quickly enough to pose something resembling a threat, which is more than Very Naughty can say. There's not much else that can be said about a boss this generic, so consider this an insult to everything else ranked below it. This is an enemy rush boss. Dum Drum dumps the enemies out of himself as his primary attack. This boss is yet another upscale generic enemy, and he only has three sprites in total. It's super minimalistic on assets. Dum Drum just moves up and down the screen when he attacks, and the sprite is just jiggled around when it releases enemies to try to convey movement. I'm not expecting a whole lot, but that's just kind of sad. Despite how minimalistic Dum Drum is, it's a step up gameplay wise from a boss just trying to ram into the player, and his attack pattern is technically more complicated than his DKC1 peers. Something that would make this boss entertaining would be if he did his drop-down attack while enemies were still on the field. It could actually be a challenging boss then. Kerosene is an extra boss added to the GBA remake of DKC2 at the Stronghold Showdown level, which is normally just a cutscene. While adding a boss battle here is a nice thought, Kerosene doesn't exactly deliver. A giant dragon kremlin sounds like a cool idea and all, but he's modeled really awkwardly, particularly with his bizarre damaged animation. All of the classic DKC sprites were originally 3D models before they became sprites. The developers of this GBA remake are trying to replicate that effect with kerosene here, but it really doesn't work out all that well. They're clearly not nearly as talented as the original developers. The super saturated colors of the GBA remake certainly aren't doing any favors for this guy, especially that puke green background. His sprites just mesh like trash with the rest of the game, and at the end of the day, he's another glorified head and hands boss like Tiki Tong. The rest of his body doesn't actually do anything, it's just in the background. The cool thing that this boss does have is using cleavers, a previous boss, as weapons. However, he seems to stop doing that after the first phase. Instead, he opts for a more generic fist pounding and fire breathing, which is quite easy to be avoided. The boss looks like it was cobbled together with assets from other bosses, and it shows. Creepy Crow makes for a much better and more difficult penultimate boss. Another unimaginative design from Jungle Climber. This time, a generic Chinese dragon. The main attack the boss has that can hurt you is shooting fire from his mouth in various patterns, which DK has to avoid. When they hit the ground, they burst into shockwaves, so you can't just hide down there. You have to be on the pegs and suffering from the bad controls. After he's done shooting fire, he moves on to his next phase, which is just dashing back and forth through the holes. DK has to charge him to stun him, and then make him land on top of one of the six hooks at the edge of the arena, at which 
point, the boss will vomit up his Kremlin soul for you to attack and do damage to him. This is easy enough at first with six hooks, but the boss has four HP, and each time a hook is used, it disappears and can't be used again. It can get annoying to get the boss to land on one of the hooks when half of them are gone, as you pretty much have to be above the boss and angle yourself upside down to make use of the lower down hooks. Granted, it's not like the boss can hurt you during this time, but it's pretty annoying. This is the first boss of Jungle Climber. This boss is just as non-threatening as the first boss from its predecessor, but is significantly more flashy and complex. There are long telegraphs as the ship and its projectiles go through the background in the top screen, and you have a limited window to hit the boss as it flies across it. Yes, it's incredibly easy, but it's the first boss so I'm cutting it some slack by comparison to the others. It manages to provide something resembling tension without giving much threat to the player. As the ship passing by doesn't hurt DK, it's just just DK's chance to do damage. For some reason, this boss gets a unique boss theme. Is it generic boss theme? A okay, rule boss theme? Then one for the first boss. Apparently, the generic boss theme is supposed to be the Kremlin boss theme, and this is the only boss that isn't a Kremlin. But I still think it's a little weird this one gets a theme to itself. The point of this boss seems to be the musical gimmick of the crabs, and it's not exactly an impressive one to say the least. Most of the fight amounts to build up to the moment when the three crabs are stacked on top of each other, and even that is still a very simplistic and unimpressive attack. It really does look like a boss battle against three glorified goombas, and the parts of the fight where you're fighting against the crabs individually just feels like a complete waste of time and insulting the player's skill. While it's still more complex than something like really naughty, everything feels like like it's here for the sake of the musical. After you knock the Goomba Tower over, the boss repeats itself as you fight the individual crabs again with no real difference other than the crabs moving slightly faster. The so-called climax of the boss, where the crabs stack themselves on top of each other again, doesn't really have the same punch the second time. To give a comparison point to this boss, how's about the Koopa Brothers from Paper Mario? Those guys are four common enemies in the game who stack themselves on top of each other, but they have actual personality, unlike these generic crabs. I know this game doesn't have dialogue, but these guys actually have a decent amount of chance to show personality. They actually get to show up in a level, which no other boss in the game gets to do, but they're just kind of shooting at you in the background. It's nothing special. It's also worth mentioning that the crab leader surprisingly has a name, Captain Greenbeard. His beard is black and not green. There's no green on any of the crabs at all. Why the weird name? This jungle climber boss is a large floating head. Huge points for originality there, am I right? At least there's no two sets of hands to go along with the floating head. Instead of hands, the boss has two crystal sword things that rotate around it to try to defend itself before you can charge into it to damage it. After that, the boss will try to ram the floor when DK stops moving, crashing and making himself vulnerable. If you take too long, the boss can try to perform some other attacks, like firing rockets and boomerangs, but you should have enough of a grip on the game after some of the more difficult levels before this boss. It's rare to see the extra attacks come to play on this boss at all, because it just dies so quickly but having a variety of attacks is more than what most of the bosses below this one can say. I think this is the hardest you can make a boss in the jungle fire engine without it being too frustrating. The first elephant boss is about as pathetic as the first pig as you use its attack against it. You throw pineapples into the suction trunk, then its gigantic heart pops out and you throw bombs into it. The boss barely has any real chance to hurt you. It's mostly just about killing it more quickly and aiming the projectiles at the heart properly with the game's awkward control scheme. However, the other versions of the boss manage to improve considerably. Of all of the reused bosses, I think this one changes the most. The second version has two of the boss fighting you at once and introduces a powerful laser attack that's much harder to avoid. The surviving elephant becomes much harder to take down once you kill one of them, so the boss doesn't slow down in tension either. Surprisingly, this is only the second of the four elephant bosses. Third and fourth one are back down to one elephant. The third one is rather unimpressive and is easier than the second one if you ask me. The fourth one is still only one elephant boss, but the terrain has changed in a more interesting way to make the fight more legitimately challenging. With the pineapple bomb pickups 
attempts to hurt the boss are spread far apart. The boss is hard to hit up on his little camping platform, and you have to wall kick off a super specific part of the stage to avoid the giant sweeping laser attack. In addition, I think this is the most creative looking design of the Jungle Beat bosses. A mecha elephant with a turret trunk is the legitimately cool idea. That weird beating heart is a strange choice, though. You really need is such a big kill me light on the boss. It's rather obvious the boss is stunned without that already. For this boss fight, you play as Ellie the Elephant and suck in water from the waterfall to shoot at the boss monster's eyes. Meanwhile, Squirt will try to spit water at you to try to push you off the ledge to your death. That sounds like a cool and inventive concept for a boss fight aesthetically, but as far as how it plays, you run around in a circle to avoid Squirt shooting water, then attack him when he's vulnerable. Rinse and repeat. The gameplay loop for this boss is pretty dull. You're just doing the same thing over and over. The difficulty increases just by shooting the water faster and leaving himself vulnerable for a less long period of time. It's a decent concept, but it really needed some more to it. He has absolutely no other attacks. You can fight this guy as the third or fourth boss. Even if he was just the third boss, he's still significantly less complex than something like Arich. This boss fight doesn't do enough to differentiate itself from the first army demo fight for me to go much higher on the tier list. It is certainly much more visually impressive, and I will have to give the boss some serious points for that. He has a jetpack, and he body slams the stage to make a shockwave, and that's cool. By all means, it should be a great boss. He even shoots out a big homing rocket out at you. What gives? The problem is he's just way too easy. This is the sixth boss, and we fought bosses that are way harder than this one before at this point in the game. Everything still only does a single hit out of the player's now gigantic life bar. Yes, more gigantic than before, the player's life bar is now 12 HP. You would really think that the comically oversized homing rocket, at the least, would take out a full watermelon worth of health, so 4 HP, rather than a single watermelon piece so 1 HP, like absolutely everything else in the game. Even if the attacks did do more damage, they're all also still too easy to avoid. Projectiles just all move too slowly to ever realistically hit anything. This might have something to do with the lag present in this boss. Speedrunners will look away from Armidello as much as possible to try to minimize the lag and make his attacks go faster. While they do this on most bosses, it's by far the most noticeable on this one, to the point that even a casual playthrough will notice how laggy this bosses. This boss essentially amounts to a force scroller platforming stage, and a very easy one at that. It doesn't feel much like a boss, as the boss mole himself only shows up at the very end for an insultingly easy finale. The only real way you could die is by somehow jumping off the edge, but there's no real reason that should happen unless you're trying to kill yourself. Most of this fight is just waiting for it to be over as you avoid very easily dodged attacks with nothing you can do to speed it up or fight back. The bowl goons also drop tons of hearts for you to recover your HP, just in case this fight wasn't easy enough. I know that every boss in the retro games drops hearts at some point, but in this one in particular, you're just drowning in them. There's so many hearts. That's why I say that the only way to die in this fight is to fall off the ledge, because that's an instant kill. You're never gonna die by taking damage. This is the fourth boss in King of Swing. It's a bit more complicated compared to the other ones. It still is only hard because of the control scheme, and it's kind of similar to Creepy Crow from DKC2, just with pegs. You climb upwards while running away from the boss, then throw bombs into his mouth. Both of these things should be quite easy in theory, but aiming the bombs into the boss's mouth as he moves can be surprisingly difficult, especially while making sure you don't get hit. Watching a player fight, this looks pathetically easy, but it's much harder in practice. Still, it's not nearly as generic or dull as Fire Neki, so it gets a higher ranking.
the idea behind this boss is creative, and its design is certainly more appealing than the likes of the crabs or the chicken from Returns. You have to go around the rotating wheels, pounding the blue switches to make the boss vulnerable, then you jump on top of his head. It looks pretty visually interesting and can look intimidating at first, but it's, again, much easier than it appears. Mango Ruby does not attack outside of moving around, meaning he technically does not have a pattern any more complicated than very naughty. You're basically fighting the arena more than you're fighting the boss, who doesn't do anything other than move around in seemingly random patterns. The boss really needed some other form of attack to spice things up, especially when it's the fifth boss. Maybe something when the boss splits apart into smaller versions of itself, like the Manta Ray from Mario Sunshine? This is arguably the hardest boss in DKC2 besides K Rule, but it's not for especially good reasons. You play as Squawks during this boss, and Squawks' gameplay in general is some of the absolute hardest in DKC2 and DKC3, especially on the nightmarish animal antics level. While this is nowhere near as hard as that, it still makes this boss quite difficult compared to a lot of the other easier bosses in the game. A lot of players never even realize that King Sing's weakness is a stinger and will just fire pellets at him aimlessly and until one happens to hit that location. Yeah, the stinger is red to indicate that it is in fact his weakness, but it's small and hard to see against the background. It's also not the easiest of targets to hit if King Zing is trying to home in on you and is currently facing you, forcing you to go around him to hit him. Eventually, King Zing shrinks down into a normal zinger and summons several additional zingers for shields. The boss was already pretty generic visually, so turning into the literal generic enemy sprite is not doing it any favors in that department. It's not different enough to rank it separately, but the Game Boy version of this boss heavily suffers from the zoomed-in camera. The boss is also stronger with the ability to fart out more zingers behind himself as he moves, becoming a real nightmare. It's not that bad if you know what to do, but an unaware player can easily be caught off guard. These four bosses are probably the best bosses in Jungle Beat. Not because they're challenging, because they're not, but because they get away from the core gameplay system. Which is a good thing when that system is kind of terrible. The gameplay style changes to punch out when fighting these enemy apes, and punch out fights are way more interesting than the rest of Jungle Beat's fare. That said, by punch out standards, these fights are awful and stupidly simplistic, but they're an acceptable distraction compared to the regular boss fights. These four guys all have unique designs that aren't just recolors of each other, which is a really big bonus compared to the others. They are by far the most visually impressive bosses of the game, with both detailed models and backgrounds. I will say Sumo Kong's background is way too over the top when it's in the middle of outer space, but at least it's trying, which is more than can be said for the rest of Jungle Beat, which is just phoning it in most of the time. Arich is a very simplistic boss in both design and boss battle, being a generic giant spider, which we've already had one of, but he's at least not an upscaled enemy, like the Country 1 bosses. He will never hit you as he lunges down, and you can surprisingly jump on the sides of his body to reach the barrel that can damage him on the top of the tree, which feels weird. His main method of attack that can actually hurt you is by spitting tiny, unimpressive looking projectiles that bounce off the walls. You would think they would get something more visually interesting for how he attacks. It is still really rare for these to hit you, but the real threat isn't so much them hitting you as destroying your barrel, forcing you to repeat the phase. Protecting your barrel from getting hit can be a lot harder than you might think, especially on the last phase, helping to make this boss a bit more engaging rather than being quite as mindlessly easy as some of the others. Still, you'll be hard pressed to find yourself taking damage against him, and most of the time you're just sitting in the corner waiting for most of the projectiles that weren't even close to hitting you to just go flying off the screen. Another super simplistic boss. This guy mainly rains down projectiles and occasionally passes down on you from overhead. It's basically a harder version of Crow. The dynamic of having to get higher in the air before throwing the bomb at the boss is at least kind of interesting, jumping up on the pillars to reach him before the bomb you're carrying explodes. The pillars blow up throughout the fight, making it more challenging to hit him. He has a decent variety of bomb-based attacks, but they're all too simplistic for me to rank the boss any higher than it is. I do have to give credit to the design of the boss. It's nothing particularly memorable at a glance, but when the boss is defeated and his golden armor cracks off to reveal his bloated body, it's a pretty funny moment that helps to add some character to this otherwise run-of-the-mill boss.
Mugly is the first boss from DKCR. He's simple, but he's the first boss, so what do you expect? He's similar to Very Naughty and Really Naughty, with his only attacks being that he runs across the screen or he jumps up high. However, he's much better executed, taking a whopping 9 hits to kill since getting those hits is so easy. Very Naughty and Really Naughty's mercy and vulnerability periods after they get hit are arbitrary and have no real visual indicator, but Mugly will grow spikes to briefly show he's invulnerable. Mugly also has a unique design, visually changes throughout the boss battle as he enters his later phases, and has an interesting background with the Tiki audience. There's just so much more going on here than in Very Naughty. This is what that generic boss concept looks like with a budget and polish. <laughs> Tiki Tong has an infamous reputation, and a lot of people would have rated this boss as low as I put Cactus King. While people hated the Tikis replacing the Kremlings in general, Tiki Tong himself was especially hated for having the credit of replacing K. Rule directly. When you die in DKCR, you get to see a silhouette of the Tiki boss of that world. When you die in the final world, however, there's a question mark instead, implying that there might be some kind of reveal, such as K. Rule being the final boss. Fans were desperately hoping K. Rule would make an appearance at the time. Somebody even made some Tiki K. Rule fan art and posted it as a supposed leak. Of course, fans would then be disappointed to find out that the final boss was not only a Tiki, but the most unimaginative Tiki one could think of with the single biggest boss design cliche in existence, the Head and Hands boss. The boss battle itself is definitely the easiest of any of these final bosses. The hands do move through the air rather quickly during the first phase to make them a bit harder to avoid than they appear, but once one of the two hands is gone, the rest of the hands phase is very easy. Tiki Tong has a move with one hand where he'll fake out slamming the ground with his palm and laugh at you, but even if he does fake you out, he laughs for so long that he doesn't actually take advantage of the fact that he faked you out to hit you, he just completely wastes the opportunity that he made for himself. This means the fake out is just pointless. While Tiki Tong's attack later on, where he rains down flaming Tiki's, can be a bit hard to avoid, Tiki Tong provides a shocking amount of hearts during this boss battle and just makes the fight too easy. No less than 5 in a game where you can come in with as much as 4 HP. Yes, the hearts are on fire fire at first can't be picked up immediately, but that hard hit box really shouldn't become a hard you can use to recover at all. It's just too easy for a final boss. The only reason I don't have Tiki Tong ranked lower, which he absolutely deserves to be, is because he has some characterization. Not much compared to the other final bosses, but enough for me to not just hate the character. The entire plot of the game is that Tiki Tong is having his Tiki generals gather him bananas. Afterwards, he turns those bananas into some kind of magic juice, which turns his underlings into hands. While a lot of villains kill their own minions, I don't think I've ever seen a hilariously pathetic reason to do so. Tiki Tong's entire villainous goal is just to get some hands and become the stereotypical Andros ripoff, to the point he will kill his own minions to do it. They even seem willing to become his hands. It's not like they're resisting or anything. Of course. These hands that Tiki Tong put so much effort into creating are casually destroyed by DK effortlessly five minutes later, which just makes this all the more hilarious to me. You could easily argue that this is a bad thing and it makes Tiki Tong a worse villain rather than a better one, but this characterization sticks out to me compared to some of the other really generic bosses on the list. He's still terrible by final boss standards, but he's not being compared to the other final bosses to get this high. A possessed sword is a pretty cool idea for a boss. Unlike Dum Drum, who just kind of sits there and feels more like an inanimate object, this boss floats through the air in a spooky fashion like a ghost. The Kremlin skull and crossbones on the sword makes you wonder if there might be some kind of spirit possessing the sword or something, rather than there just being a painted skull and crossbones on Dum Drum, which is a lot more lame. The boss itself is really simplistic, but watching a sword try to slash and cleave at you through the air is pretty interesting. The boss fight relying on a chase segment as the main difficulty is kind of iffy, and it's still quite an easy boss to avoid the much challenge. Still though, compared to some of the bosses this one is ranked above, it's at least possible for you to lose by falling into the lava. Cudgel is a pretty generic and boring boss with a really simple attack pattern of jumping around. The main unique thing about him is the fact that he's so heavy that he causes earthquakes when he lands if you don't jump when he does, which can briefly stun the Kongs. It's an interesting idea, but the fact the boss is so easy means it should probably just kill you. It's more unique this way, but he can really do with another attack or two. That said, if he manages to stun you and corner you, 
He has a pretty good chance of killing one of your Kongs. The reason I rank this boss a bit higher than the fight itself deserves is just because it's nice to finally see a Kremlin be the boss for once. Outside of K. Rool, Kajo is the only boss who is a real crocodile Kremlin type of guy. He's got a nice memorable design that actually looks like what you'd expect out of a Kremlin pirate boss, rather than something that was picked because it would make a good video game boss, if you know what I mean. He looks like an actual character, not just a generic monster. Clubba, the NPC, is a recolor of Kajul, and it would make a lot more sense if they were the same character. Apparently, Clubba is so much stronger than Kajul that Diddy and Dixie can't beat him when they try to fight him when you select the option, which seems kind of dumb to me when we meet up a recolor of him. By this logic, Clubba is apparently stronger than K. Rule, which is stupid. I think it would make more sense if Cudgel became the NPC after he was defeated or something, rather than splitting them up into two characters. This is my favorite peg-swinging boss, and is the best of the original designs from those two games. By comparison to the similar Dragon Kremlin boss in the sequel, this one has a much better design and isn't fought in such a linear fashion. While the boss can be frustrating because of the controls, like every other boss in the game, there's multiple ways of defeating him, and I like that. You can either ram into him at the end of his pattern before grabbing onto his peg tail, or you can just grab onto his tail at any time. Grabbing the tail is much harder, but it's faster and can be more rewarding if you pull it off. Obviously, it's harder than it looks because the control scheme and all. After you grab the boss by his tail, you're gonna spin him around while you're rotating around the peg you're holding onto with your other hand. If his body comes into contact with the spikes on the edge, he gets hurt. Based on the physics and hit detection, he can take wildly different amounts of damage. This can get really frustrating as you barely hurt him on some grabs, and if you're bad at this game like most people, you'll be focused on grabbing him at all to deal any damage whatsoever. The hit detection can feel pretty off sometimes, and the match can become an endurance test. You also have to be sure to grab him quickly after you ram him, as his tail could quickly fall to the floor where you can't grab it. This is an annoying boss that could use more polish, but does have a nice skill curve to it. It is much more imaginative than the other bosses in the game. For the gimmick is basically, it's a generic boss, but it usually a peg swinging gameplay, so it's hard. This is a very easy boss if you know what to do, and basically amounts to a puzzle boss, but it's way more inventive than the other first bosses from DKC1 and DKC2. A giant sentient barrel that belches barrel is really funny, and it makes for a great first boss. DK has been abusing barrels throughout all of his games, so it makes sense that one of them would fight back. While you do have to do the tried and true cliche of throwing the projectiles of the boss back at him, how he's defeated is unique. Belcher doesn't die after a set amount of hits, you have to force him to burp himself off the back of the ledge the force of the burp. By the same token, Belcher is a rare boss who doesn't hurt the player on contact, but he slowly advances and tries to push the player off the opposite ledge, turning the boss battle into a sumo match. Yeah, it's still obviously easy, but it's the first boss that's supposed to be, and I think this is Rare's best first boss for sure. Puff Toss has Linky Kong put into a boat where all he can do is move. There's a jump button, but it serves absolutely no purpose. By traveling around the arena, Lanky can drive through magically appearing stars, which magically cause electrical poles to rise up from the water magically. If you get up five, they will electrocute Puff Toss for a hit, making progress in the fight. If you don't do this in a certain amount of time, the poles go back into the water for some reason. The boss is really arbitrary and tacky with its logic, feeling very much like some weird mini-game rather than a boss fight because everything that's happening is so weird. Puff Toss doesn't even move from the center of the arena when he could easily just crush you by swimming into you casually. It doesn't make any sense at all. While the theming of the boss is kind of bad, gameplay-wise it's surprisingly alright and can even provide a decent challenge. Many players will often fail to go through all of the stars on the last hit or two in time, forcing the phase to reset and making them continue to dodge Puff Toss's fireballs and shockwaves. With 8 points worth of health, it's hard to get damage enough to die under any real circumstances, which is unfortunate. Puff Toss mostly just delays the fight. It's rare he's actually gonna threaten you. If you want a hard mode version of this fight, you can fight him on the emulator. Unless the emulator is set to very specific settings on a super specific version, the timer will tick down much faster than it's supposed to, which can make him one of the hardest bosses in the entire series. I'm not deducting points from him since it's not the developer's fault. If anything, it's a nice feature for somebody looking to mix the game up.
Dogadon does significantly more to improve himself from his first fight than his fellow Donkey Kong 64 boss, Armidillo. While the start is the same, he will stop to create shockwaves shortly before he is hit, forcing Chunky to pick up and throw a barrel at him quickly or suffer the consequences. Yeah, the shockwave would normally be easy to avoid, but you can't avoid it when you're hitting a barrel, so it puts you on a timer. The giant wall of flame being a single hit of damage that is so hard to avoid is also a good point in the boss's favor, since the player has a ridiculously large amount of HP anyway. Most players assume it's outright unavoidable, but you can grab the ledge to avoid taking a hit. The damage from this attack is mostly just for flash though, since the only way anybody realistically loses this fight is because of the time limit in the next phase. Chunky becoming a giant to fight Dogadon is something that's really cool looking and makes the fight a lot more cinematic. While we're talking about that, Chunky being terrified of Dogadon at the start is also 10 out of 10. Gameplay wise though, becoming a giant doesn't really add that much to the fight. The platform begins sinking into to the lava to add a time limit, and the only way to run out of time is due to lack of information. Damage seems to be counted on Dogadon in individual hits. Regardless of their animations, everything does one hit worth of damage. This means that mashing B for your generic combo does by far the most damage. Most players will try other attacks like the Z plus B primate punch, but these all just waste massive amounts of time, there's nothing to indicate this. The only way I've ever seen someone lose this fight is by not knowing the optimal way to damage the boss. The hunky chunky barrel also won't spawn if you're standing on top of where it spawned, which can waste some time if you don't know that. This is a gimmick boss fought in a unique gameplay style from the rest of the game, but I would say it's handled significantly better than the Jungle Beat Bunch-Out sections. For one, it's not repeated four times, and for two, the character is way more memorable. An evil snowman is a simple choice, but this guy just oozes charm, particularly with his evil laughs and firing snowballs out of his hat rather than just throwing them. While the boss's patterns are pretty easy to get down, it's a very fun and memorable boss. While it is easy, the fact it's a gimmick gameplay style means it shouldn't be too difficult anyway, or else it'd just be really frustrating. The boss doesn't just come completely out of nowhere and blindside the player. At Swanky Kong's tent, you can play a throwing game against Cranky to earn some worthless prizes. Cranky Kong is a pathetic opponent, but he provides some decent practice leading up to Bleed. It would definitely have been cool if these Swanky Kong games scaled in difficulty in each world, as tents for him are littered around the game world that function identically. Maybe Bleak could show up as an opponent there after his boss fight? DKC2 is a legendary game and K. Rool has a fantastic boss battle in it, but it's not this one. The second boss battle against him in the Lost World requires you to get 100%, which is much harder than finishing the game normally and will take quite some time. For some reason, this second boss fight against K. Rool is much easier and shorter though. Most players are shocked to find that K. Rool's defeated in only a single hit. Sure, it's hard to get that one hit, but it's still way shorter than the original boss. A perfect run takes 3 minutes and 40 seconds to beat, and a minute and 15 seconds to beat the rematch. K. Rool's attack variety is also much sparser in this version, with him just shooting a trillion projectiles in hard to avoid patterns. That all said, it's still definitely a good boss, just underwhelming in the context where it's placed. The arena is absolutely gorgeous, and when K. Rool is defeated and falls into the Crocodile Core, apparently that somehow caused the entire island to sink. While K. Rool personally makes his getaway on a sailboat, he's indirectly caused the deaths of thousands of Kremlings and made them lose their homeworld. You can definitely see why he would be hated by his people in DKC3. Chaos is mostly as high as he is for aesthetics. He's a super cool looking boss, particularly when you see his robotic skeleton head under his visor. He also has really strong story connections, as he's a robot K. Rool uses as a puppet to lead the Kremlings after they grew to hate him in DKC2, which is absolutely hilarious in the best way. It's a great development for his character. K. Rool actually has stakes after each game, compared to some generic recurring loser like Bowser who just shows up every game like nothing happens. It's definitely nice to see from a cartoon animal platformer game like this. Definitely not something you see every day. Chaos's boss battle is a bit on the easy side, unfortunately, but it's still interesting for one of the earlier game bosses by comparison to Squirt. Running underneath Chaos to avoid getting burned alive is easy, but I've seen people think they had to duck under it to not get burned due to the graphics, which makes the boss significantly harder, if that's what you think. Aside from that, the main challenge of the boss is just to jump over the blades and get onto Chaos's head and cross 
crush it with your Gorilla Girth, because if you're not fast enough, a boxing glove will knock you down. The issue is that even when players do fail, there's not much penalty for getting knocked off. They just have to wait through another cycle before trying again, since the boxing glove doesn't do actual damage. I think it might be cool if it did both damage and knocked you back. Chaos's final attack has his visor come off and attack the Kong separately by shooting lasers, which is flashy and cool, but very easy to avoid. It doesn't attack during Chaos's point of vulnerability, which is what it would need to do to be helpful. This is another boss that's awesome aesthetically, and it provides a legitimate challenge to boot. Bringing back a pitiful World 1 boss like Crow from the dead is a fantastic concept, he doesn't fight in even slightly the same way as his original fight. While Crow doesn't attack directly himself too much, and his minions are mostly easy to avoid, he'll send them faster throughout the fight. As the match goes on, the arena you fight Crow on gets smaller, before the final one you have to fight Crow on leaves barely any space to avoid Crow's necky minions without falling to your death. Of course, the main thing that makes this fight legitimately difficult is the chase sections. Crow throws a barrage of eggs from off-screen to batter the player as they climb up ropes, which can be very difficult to avoid at times. This is significantly harder and more varied than the chase from Cleaver, and there's more to the fight than the chase phase as well. Overall, it's a great lead-up to the game's K. Rule fight. This is another extra fight against K. Rule, this time in Donkey Kong Country 3. The regular final fight against him is considerably better. Unlike the DKC2 bonus K. Rule fight, this one is almost entirely unique, which is obviously good, but it can be rather frustrating. K. Rule's hitbox to hit him with barrels is very awkwardly specific, particularly when he's in the background. It can take a long time to get the timing down, and sometimes it seems like the barrels fall down on top of K. Rule harmlessly, even when it looks like a clean hit due to his extremely specific hit. Box. You already have to account for a big delay from when the barrel is thrown into the ceiling before it drops down into the background. Having to do that on top of adjusting for a terrible hitbox is not great. There's a minimal indication as to where you should even really hit him. The other big gimmick of the boss fight is that you need to use the barrel to block the electric waves coming from the sides. I've seen people take a long time to learn this, as it's far from the most intuitive thing in the world. Keeping the barrel straight with the moving conveyor belt isn't the easiest task either. And while it can be hard, most of it will come from all of the failed hits on K. Rule due to his wonky hitbox. Even when he's in the foreground, it's way harder to hit him than in the first fight for some reason. All of this said, I'm still saying it's a good fight overall, given it's very challenging and unique, but this is why it's not at the top tier. This fight definitely could have used some fine tuning, and if they just made the hitbox more generous, it would easily have made top 10. And this is the winner of the best non-K Rule boss from the Classic Country series. It has several different phases, varies things up, and it's surprisingly difficult without being annoying. The first phase has you fighting in a rather cramped space up above Barbos as lurchins approach you from below. You have to hit these lurchins at precise angles to knock them into Barbos's minion shields protecting him, which is surprisingly one of the hardest phases of the boss fight. Still, it's not too bad because there's not much he can do to hurt you during it. When Barbos becomes vulnerable, he will constantly smoosh his body between his spiked shell over and over, taunting you with a 10 out of 10 smug expression. He's so full of himself, I love it. More importantly, during this vulnerable phase, he's actually moving quickly enough that it's hard to hit him without getting hurt. It makes it significantly more believable than the average platformer boss with the generic kill me phase. It's like he's taunting you and still trying to attack you. For the next phase, you have to bait homing squids into his minion shields, making Barbos vary things up. For the final phase, Barbos traps you below himself, helping to crush you with his girth, and several spikes fired from his shell. In addition, he strategically positions himself to cover up part of his vulnerable body, and gets even faster with opening and closing up his shell. This part repeats for a few times before he's defeated. They put in way more effort into this boss than a lot of the other ones in the classic series. He's way more complicated, and I applaud them for that. The winner of the best DKCR boss is 
Thugly, with absolutely no competition. Mugly was like an AAA version of Very Naughty, so it makes sense he should have a harder version as a later boss, right? Of course, for Thugly to play so high, he is almost entirely different from Mugly, sharing almost nothing in common with Mugly besides design, which has also received an upgrade to be significantly more intimidating. His attacks vary up throughout the fight, with him creating shockwaves as he jumps, breathing a stream of fire you have to jump over, and shooting fireballs that split apart. Unlike Mugly, this boss has very limited moments of vulnerability due to his armored shell covering up his weak spot for most of the fight. In addition, when he ramps the wall, he doesn't immediately fall over and make himself vulnerable. Instead, he will walk backwards in a dizzy stupor as rocks fall from the ceiling, before falling onto his back and making himself vulnerable. It doesn't look that hard to hit him, but trust me, it is. And if you don't, you're gonna repeat that entire phase again. With most bosses, when a boss becomes vulnerable, there's zero chance the player won't hit them, but that is not the case here. This is the first appearance of any Tropical Freeze boss on the list. Every game besides Tropical Freeze has had bad bosses littering the bottom and low tiers, which is a testament to how good Tropical Freeze and its bosses really are. While Tropical Freeze has only six bosses, all of them are great in their own right. Retro Studios heard the complaints from Donkey Kong Country Returns and took them directly into consideration. The new group of enemies are far more characterized than the Tiki's. As we've seen with the other entries, there were very few bosses that were good that were Kremlings anyway. Of course, this is no excuse for them to do K. Rule himself dirty. He shouldn't be a package deal with the Kremlings, but we'll get to him later. On to Puppy himself. This is easily the best first boss in the series, and is up there for some of the best first platformer bosses ever. His half-pipe arena is a great theme that makes sense for the boss who's constantly acting like the big oafish seal that he is. While the first few hits are very easy to jump onto his back, it takes many hits to defeat him as the fight becomes increasingly more complex. He has more attacks than the vast majority of bosses who aren't from Tropical Freeze, with great care and dedication put into all of his animations. The main part of it that can get a bit challenging are when the extra enemies get involved, bouncing around the half-pipe arena with their physics to hurt the player. At the end of the fight, Pompey summons a horde of penguins to slide through the half-pipe with him, providing himself with some protection for once. The challenge level feels like exactly where it should be for a first boss, giving tons of engagement and not a free pass through. At the same at the same time, it's not just some generic boss thrown together with, like, one attack. Baboom has a variety of attacks, with it not always being clear to the player when he can be struck if they're fighting him blind, which can make him a bit harder than he's supposed to be. However, he can be jumped on at almost any time, making there be many ways of defeating this boss, which makes it less of a scripted event like how most of these other boss fights play out. During the easy, earlier phases, it's also optional whether you just jump on them or rely on throwing bombs back at them. While his attacks start out nice and simple like any boss, this is just to tutorialize the later phase where the gameplay really begins. Of course, you're not going to be hit by Baboom when the monkeys swing one at a time, but when multiple come and or throw bombs as they go, things can be very hectic very fast. One thing that's never been especially clear about Baboom is who the other apes are exactly. He summons them at the start, so I assume they're just duplicates of him, but later on in the fight they seemingly get killed and the main blue Baboom summons the others back from the dead as ghosts. Duplicates can't have ghosts, right? I think there are three apes, not just one ape and two poofed up by magic, but that just raises the question. Who is Baboom? Is he just the blue one? Or does it refer to all three of them? He even has a title, Baboom the Boisterous. You'd think if it were three of them, they'd call them the Baboom Brothers or something, rather than Baboom and two unnamed apes. Neither explanation of the Baboom's being summoned or being brothers makes much sense. They both contradict each other a lot. The intro to this boss shows a pair of critters desperately working on constructing King Cutout. King Cutout isn't some magical piece of cardboard, he's been built by these two poor critters who had to scrounge together a boss battle, whatever that is, at the last minute to try to guard the boss key properly. The last two worlds before this one have had rematches against Army Dillo and Dogadon, so it seems like the Kremlings have run out of bosses to throw at you. This is all they could scrounge together as a last resort when they were told the Kongs were coming in a few minutes. So the 
Critters hoist up the cardboard and try to fight the Kong, shooting lasers from his general direction to try to scare the Kongs into thinking this is really K. Rool or something. The Critters even attempt to do their best K. Rool impression, which ends up about as well as you'd expect. <laughs> If you couldn't tell, I find this ball nothing short of hysterical, and I have great memories of it as a kid. As the boss fight goes on, and the cardboard cutout starts falling apart, the critters get even more desperate because they so desperately need to find some way to scare the Kongs away. They go out into the arena wearing bed sheets, trying to make them think they're ghosts. You just gotta feel sorry for these guys. The boss is better than you might think gameplay-wise, too. At this point in the game, the Kongs have a whopping 12 HP, so defeating the player by dealing damage to them is completely out of the question. The boss fight solves this problem by introducing some much-needed instant kills. To damage the boss, you shoot your current Kong into King Cutout, but if the cardboard Kremlin isn't there, the Kong gets shot over and dies. You have five Kongs to work with, so you can only mess up four times. As the fight goes on, the critters will change where they put up the cardboard cutout very quickly to try to make you misfire. In addition, they'll put up some fake cutouts that just get you killed if you ran into them. I will say this is one of the cheaper aspects of the boss, as the only indication as to which one is real is that the fake ones are darker and don't fire lasers. Nobody's really gonna realize that, it often takes players a while. Refighting the boss with all of the surprise factor gone, it's definitely pretty easy, but King Cutout is an unforgettable experience the first time you fight him. Mad Jack has always been one of my favorite Donkey Kong boss fights. The fight may look really simple as the boss's primary attack is just to jump towards you. This phase doesn't get much more complicated as the boss goes on either, rather than him just getting faster. He becomes invisible, but that's mostly just an aesthetic difference as you can still tell where he is with the magic sparkles following him around. Still, this can be hard to get used to on the first time around, and force the player to master the game's movement to surpass. Most players will just go directly from tile to tile in a linear fashion, but you can risk making a harder jump to a platform diagonally away, or even jump back onto the platform you were already on. This is the only boss in DK64 that is challenging in a very direct, very mechanical sense. Unlike most of these bosses, it's not a puzzle boss. Beating him once doesn't mean he's easy if you decide to refight him again. The only real cheap shot he can get on you is the game not explaining the mechanic he has with the switches. Once he stops chasing you, Mad Jack will throw fireballs at you until you press one of the two switches or fall out of the arena. One switch is on a white tile and one's on a blue tile. You have to hit the switch of the same color as the tile Mad Jack is sitting on to damage him. Otherwise, you'll get hit instead. It's a beginner's trap, but taking one hit of damage isn't too much punishment anyway, especially in the first phase. The issue I would more directly like to be fixed is falling down out of the arena. Most of the difficulty in this fight will come from falling, and it does penalize the player. However, all it does is reset the current phase Mad Jack is on without dealing any damage from the fall. Tiny Kong is just brought back up into the arena. While this is already one of the hardest fights, I would still really prefer if this dealt damage. Yeah, if Mad Jack personally knocks you off the stage, it'll do a damage point, but I think that without Mad Jack doing that should also hurt you. That said, resetting the phase still gives plenty of more opportunities to get hit. I'm more just complaining about the giant life bar DK64 has, which is 8 HP at the time of the boss fight. I've been doing that pretty much every single time DK64 has come up on the list. Getting the last hit is one of the hardest parts of the fight. You have to fake out Mad Jack's laser beam rather than mindlessly advancing towards the target of your choice. The randomized location of the switches also make this fight a lot less mindless than the other, much more scripted boss encounters. You have to move around the arena to even see where the switches are half the time before you can proceed to go to them, forcing the player to pay attention and not just go in a mindless route. This fight is by far the flashiest K. Rool has ever had, if not one of the flashiest platforming bosses ever. You have five boxing rounds with each character against K. Rool, and they all use their various abilities in very unique ways against him. This fight is filled with tons of slapstick. Diddy Kong makes ceiling lights fall on top of K. Rool's head to damage him, then Lanky abuses the fact that K. Rool is blind in the next phase by luring him around to the sound of his trombone into giant banana peels to make him trip. No, you didn't miss anything. That is absolutely just as cartoony as it sounds. The most surreal part of this all, though, is Tiny Kong's phase, where she uses her size-shifting ability to go inside K. Rool's shoe to fight his toes. 
Creativity is unparalleled here, you couldn't ask for much more. The spectacle is the main reason as to why DK64K rules this high, but I can't put him up any further in good faith. Because of how the boss fight works, it basically boils down into five mini-games to damage K rule. He's not going to do all that much to hurt you in the process, as he generally only has one attack per phase. For most of the phases, he's just running around aimlessly and easily avoided. The boss fight really boils down into five puzzle bosses, and when you refight K. Rule when you know how he works, there's really not all that much enjoyment to be got out of it by comparison to Mad Jack, even if K. Rule is a superior experience to fight for the first time. The developers did thankfully address DK64's giant health bar in this fight, as the main loss condition is running out of time to reset the current round. This recovers K. Rule's health while leaving any damage K. Rule up to the Kong, so it's a decent threat, but K. Rule's not exactly doing a lot of damage, and the Kong's health restores when the characters are swapped. Theoretically, if the player gets to round 12 and times out, that's an instant loss, but this has never happened to anyone on the face of the planet without them trying to do it just to figure out what happens. Outright losing to K. Rule is a very rare occurrence, unfortunately, and they really should have been more strict with that round limitation thing. While the first three phases can give you some problems, the Tiny Kong phase against K. Rool's toes is probably the hardest one gameplay-wise, and the one I'd say is the best overall. Aside from being the most inventive concept, there's really no puzzle aspect to this phase compared to the others. It's just direct gameplay, and it's done well. Unfortunately, I think the worst one of these phases is the Chunky phase, which is the final phase, and makes the fight end on a sour note. There's no puzzle to this phase, and it's very easy and straightforward to complete. And of all of the cartoony logic, I think that one is kind of the dumbest, with all of the barrels, pads, all the arbitrary crap Chunky needs just appearing out of nowhere. Scowl's boss fight is like a miniature bullet hell with the amount of projectiles he fires at players. His Fan of Knives style feathers burst out like a shotgun blast and can easily catch players off guard as they cover much more space than they initially appear. Scowl also forces players to navigate a miniature platform wave while holding an enemy to throw at him later, climbing them up to attack him. His deadliest attack, though, is a squadron of minions he sends down to attack the player. Like Crow, he also sends babies complete with their eggshells still on to fight for him, but at least he's not shattering their eggs open and killing unborn children like Crow. As the minions come down, they only desynchronize from each other halfway through their flight path, giving players minimal time to react and fit through the cracks in the otherwise perfect wall formation. Scowl will constantly vary things up throughout the boss, and he has no shortage of ways to attack the player. While Baboom steals the Kong's bananas in his intro, Scowl is some kind of judge in his, and smashes a bunch of banana with a giant judge's gavel. It's pretty great the only reason he's even doing that is just to make DK angry at him. He's definitely one of the coolest and most intimidating DK bosses. It's hard to argue with that badass who. It's impressive they managed to make an owl be legitimately threatening. I also wonder if this whole court introduction for Scowl might be a reference to the Court of Owls from Batman. They're kind of obscure as far as Batman villains go, but it makes more sense than referencing Billy Mitchell in Donkey Kong Country Returns. This fight's definitely been discussed to death. Anybody familiar with Donkey Kong or Smash has seen the first K. Rool fight a billion times, if not played it themselves. I was surprised on my most recent replay of the game that I couldn't just beat it without dying, though. The fight is definitely harder than it looks, even if you memorize it all. K. Rool's attacks aren't complicated, but he mixes and matches their speed a lot to try to fake you out and be hard to avoid. Of course, the primary speed he travels at is lightning. Back in the day, people were saying K. Rool would be a fast heavyweight in Smash because he ran so fast in this boss fight. Too bad that never happened. K. Rool's short hops in the second phase are surprisingly difficult to avoid, and he does a good job of mixing them up. While K. Rool has minimal animations to work with and is much lower budget compared to his other fights, it's good the DKC1 developers, with their extremely short schedule and minimal staff, were able to pump out one good boss fight to end the game. The fight is surprisingly atmospheric for the limited assets available for K. Rool himself. The music is the big one, of course, starting out as something like a joke theme to match K. Rool starting out the boss fight casually throwing out his crown and making himself vulnerable like an idiot. The difficulty increases over the fight greatly, though, as K. Rool realizes the Kongs aren't pushovers and starts taking the fight seriously, and the music follows suit. The real reason the fight is this high is just for the credits fake out. K. Rool playing dead shows he's not your average Bowser-tier incompetent villain. 
He's willing to do anything in his power to kill the Kongs. I got killed by the credits as a kid and was really surprised, and it's a shame that anybody who plays the game nowadays will have that legendary moment stolen from them. This was the moment that defined K. Rool's character in the first game and made him more than just a cookie-cutter villain. All that said, the fight isn't perfect. While the cannonballs are a bit harder to dodge than they look, waiting for them makes up most of the boss fight's duration. They sweep across the stage back and forth endlessly, when the vast majority of them have no chance of hitting the player and are just wasting time. It kind of just adds a loading screen to the fight when you've died multiple times. While K. Rool does vary up his attacks, the bosses above him also just have way more attacks to worry about. Fugu is a candidate for the toughest boss in the series. While I don't think he's that bad, people apparently can't wrap their heads around how the water controls work. I will admit that fighting him in the water does make the boss much harder, but I absolutely think it's fair and the player will have gone through several challenging water levels before getting to fight Fugu to help prepare them. Retro placed a higher emphasis on water levels in Tropical Freeze after criticism about not having them in returns. While it's easy to damage him when he decides to propel his weak point directly towards you during the start, Art, things get much more complicated when he starts spitting out fish for you to send back at him by rolling. Rolling speeds you up underwater, so if you happen to miss your roll, you'll get sent flying towards Fook. If he decides to start inhaling then, you'll go right into his mouth and get hit. Aiming the fish also isn't as easy as it looks, despite how huge of a target Fugu is, and neither is navigating around all of the many sea urchins you can't hit. During the final phase, the sea urchins will start stacking up and lingering if you don't get in the final hit on Fugu making even more chaos. There is very little room for error in this boss fight, as aside from everything else, you have an air meter to worry about which can instantly kill you. You have to keep going down towards the bottom to bubbles for air, which only further complicates the already legitimately difficult to avoid attacks from the boss. In particular, when Fugu becomes absolutely giant, you have to be very careful to swim around him, and if he forces you towards the top when your air is low, you're dead. While some players just can't get used to the underwater control scheme, I don't think there's anything wrong with it and find this a fantastic boss. People just need to man up and get good. Of course you can take that with a grain of salt, as I had to suffer through the terrible peg-swinging controls of the portable games. Fugu really gets everything he can out of his pufferfish design. This boss is doing everything in his power to kill you, which is really impressive with how simplistic he is. Try contrasting Fugu to the far more generic Puff Toss, who doesn't even have any attacks related to the fact he's a pufferfish. Boring. Fugu could have easily been a much more generic pufferfish boss, but they made him even laugh when he hits you during his giant phase. Retro learned their lesson from Returns. They actually cared about giving these bosses personality. This fight is significantly better than the bonus boss from the same game. It's in this fight that it's revealed that K. Rool is just using Chaos to rule over the Kremlings from the Shadows. The boss fight starts with a quick rematch against Chaos, and he gets even more damaged and we get to see even more shattered versions of his head. It's mostly just for flavor though, as it's quickly defeated and K. Rool comes out to fight the Kongs for real. After K. Rool was responsible for sinking the Kremlin homeworld into the ocean, it looks like they didn't want him in power anymore, so we had to take extreme measures. He doesn't seem nearly as mentally stable now, what with him flapping his wings like a lunatic after he gets hit. He's still willing to keep using the electricity after it gives him a horrifying shock. He's out for blood. After defeating K. Rool, it's revealed that he's kept DK and Diddy trapped inside of Chaos to use as a living battery and brainwash them. He could have easily just killed them, but he wanted to torture them. Apparently, based off the brief dialogue, the two apes were brainwashed into thinking they were Chaos until they were freed. K. Rool is definitely reduced to his most desperate state in the story here, and it makes his character way more interesting. Rather than ammunition to hurt the boss being directly given to the player, like in so many other boss battles, the player has to retrieve it themselves. The hitbox on K. Rool is much more consistent in this fight than the Nautilus one. So long as you hit K. Rool in the back, the hit should count. That said, the timing to hit K. Rool in the back with the barrel before he turns around is surprisingly tight, requiring a lot more finesse. As the fight goes on, it gets more complex with the player having to ride across levels and platforms to pull levers and get more barrels to throw at K. Rool with his giant crocodile body patrolling the stage at increasingly higher speeds. For the finale, things are mostly similar to the first phase, but the electric barrier comes on periodically, 
forcing players to act quickly to get barrels before either they or the barrel is destroyed by the electricity. The one thing I'll say I dislike about this whole boss fight scene is the dialogue at the start. K. Rool speaks in nothing but cliches and terrible TV show quotes that play down his character and make him out to be the cookie cutter villain so many of his detractors paint him as. This dialogue even makes it canon that K. Rool apparently has a wife, even though that's some throwaway line that no one thought about and it was obviously never addressed again. Bashmaster is the best boss fight in terms of aesthetics, no questions asked. During the intro, we see Bashmaster just enjoying a popsicle that he's eating before DK destroys it haphazardly, enraging him. Now, that's already a cool little intro, but the reason that's so cool is because of the environmental storytelling with the previous levels. There's a gigantic, super elaborate popsicle production line in the levels leading up to Bashmaster. Apparently, all of that was just to provide this bear man with some tasty treats. And DK just ruined the fruits of his labor. I'd be angry too. Now, Bashmaster's character design speaks for itself. A giant bear with a hammer is really hard to say no to. I praise Cudgel for similar reasons, but this is even better. It's really rare to see the generic brute enforcer have such a good boss fight as Bashmaster and done so well. Bashmaster is so beloved that some people have even suggested that he should be the final boss instead of Frederick, but he's just the raw embodiment of the brute strength enforcer role. It fits him so perfectly. While most of the Tropical Freeze bosses have great arenas, this one is the best. Floating through a purple popsicle river on an iceberg that changes with realistic physics as Bashmaster slams the arena down everywhere is pretty great. The best touch is that as Bashmaster falls into the water and gets damaged, that his white fur slowly gets dyed purple from bottom to top to signify how damaged he is. A lot of bosses just generically change color with no real explanation for this, even the retro games Poppy and Thugly do it. Bashmaster has a thematic reason for changing color and it's great to see. I considered Bashmaster as a candidate for number one, but I can't give that honor to him because the boss fight is just too easy. It's not like Bashmaster is a complete pushover or anything, he's still a great boss, but any little flaw like that can hurt you a bit at the top of the tier list. I will say that he is harder than he appears if you just look up a playthrough of him being done perfectly though. The reason is because if you make any mistake, Bashmaster will punish you badly for it, meaning the fight must be done mostly perfectly. If you don't damage him with the watermelon out of the frozen ice cubes fast enough, he'll slide over a giant tower of four ice blocks that you can't jump over to send you going into the water. You can try to throw the bomb over the ice at Bashmaster if you're going too slow, but oftentimes it'll just get blocked by another pillar of ice. Later on, Bashmaster doesn't spend so long to get his hammer on stuck out of the ice either, and will quickly swing it at you again if you manage to screw up. Bashmaster absolutely earns his spot as the best non-final boss in the series, and it's not a close contest. I'm sure if they made him the final boss like so many people wanted, they could have turned up the difficulty without much problem. Captain K. Rule is a classic boss fight and has gone down as one of the most memorable platformer bosses ever. The theming of Donkey Kong Country 2 is much better than the first game, with a shockingly dark tone for a game about cartoon apes. The final world of the first game, where K. Rule is fought, is now the first world of the new game, as Diddy and Dixie board K. Rule's ship and invade the Kremlin homeworld to try and save the kidnapped Donkey Kong. Crocodile Pirates is a fantastic theme that has never been taught by the series, with plenty of fantastic locations like the ship, swamps, beehives, and even Kremlin amusement parks. While K. Rool has defeated the Kongs in several games, this is the one where it feels the most serious. In DKC3, the tone can feel kinda cartoony with stereotypical dialogue, but here in DKC2, K. Rool's outright torturing Donkey Kong. He has him tied up and shoots cannonballs at the poor sucker. He even teases Diddy Kong by using DK like a carrot on a stick before dragging him off to his ship in Stronghold Showdown. As for the boss fight, it's the closest thing to a bullet hell you're going to get from Donkey Kong. K. Rool fires his cannonballs in varied patterns, using the suction on his blunderbuss to propel them at differing speeds and patterns to make them much harder to jump over. Some of the cannonballs will protrude spikes, showing K. Rool doesn't mess around as they take up space on the floor. All of this happens while K. Rool will try to suck you into his gun. 
For someone who's done the fight a million times, avoiding getting hit by K rule suction might seem trivial, but it may prove to be a legitimate threat to people who are still learning the boss fight. You have to throw cannonballs into K rule's gun to damage him, but you have to be careful to not just run straight into his gun in the process when he's sucking you towards it. K rule has a unique animation where he bashes you with his gun when you touch him, which is a really nice touch rather than just generically dying on contact like 95% of the other bosses. Towards the end of the fight, K rule will start shooting colored clouds out of his gun. Blue clouds stun the player to get hit by another attack, red clouds slow the player down, and purple clouds reverse the player's controls. The blue stun clouds are the ones K rule uses first and are the most effective, since after he fires them he always directly charges into the player for what usually results in the combo. The other clouds are significantly less threatening though, unfortunately. While their effects can catch a new player out the first time they get hit by them, the fact they don't do damage makes them into a lot more of a gimmick. It would be nice if, say, they killed the current Kong and applied the effect to the second Kong, or if there were so many of these clouds they were extremely hard to avoid. Neither of these is the case, though, and it's always just been a pet peeve of mine with this otherwise perfect boss fight. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one! This is an extremely controversial placing. Lord Frederick has a dedicated hate them because of the extremely dedicated K. Rule fanbase. I know firsthand because I'm one of the people who was passionately advocating for K. Rule to get into Smash ever since Brawl. When Tropical Freeze released, People were quick to watch footage of Frederick's boss fight and hate him for not being K. Rool. I was among those people. I was in the chats right there when it happened and complaining about how generic it was. It really hurt at the time, with K. Rool being snubbed in both his home series and in Smash during Smash Bros. 4. There was even another leak theory, quote-unquote, about Frederick being K. Rool that was similar about how they thought Tiki Tong was going to be K. Rool, but it basically just amounted to, Frederick is fat, therefore he's K. Rool. The bigger issue with Frederick is people insisting that he's a carbon copy of K. Rule, as an obese animal king who leads a group of animal villains. He charges across the screen like King K. Rule, his horn is compared to Captain K. Rule's blunderbuss, and him going into the background getting attacked there is compared to Baron K. Rule and Stein's Nautilus fight. I have to say to all that, really? K. Rule is in Smash now, we don't have to keep pretending we hate this boss. Retro didn't put in Frederick because they hated K. Rule. It was done as a homage to the character because Kensuke Tenavi, the guy who sucked the soul out of Paper Mario and says that he actively adores fan opinions, forbid them from using the Kremlings. Um, so this is something that we actually talked about fairly early on uh, with, Miss, uh, with Miyamoto san. Um, and we were really, you know, we're getting together and we're like, well, what are we going to do about King K. Rule? Is he coming back? And we thought about it and we said, well, does he really need to? Um, why don't we just come up with something completely new? And uh, this time, make sure there are no crocodiles in there. Frederick's charge attack is nothing like K. Rule's mechanically. Frederick charges across the arena at blazing fast speeds, head first, trying to hit you with his helmet, whereas K. Rule just runs at you. Unlike K. Rule, Frederick's charge attack is actually where he's vulnerable. You have to jump on his back as he passes over, and it's an extremely tight window. If you jump on top of his back all three times, you can move on to the next phase immediately, but that's a tall order, meaning the phases are more likely than not going to repeat unless you're really good. Just avoiding the three charges Frederick does wouldn't be hard if you didn't have to land on him, which makes the attack a shockingly legitimate threat for how simple it looks. Frederick's point of vulnerability is a legitimate attack that he doesn't look like an idiot for using, unlike 99% of platformer bosses and most of the boss fights on this list. As for the background mechanics being taken from Baron K. Ruinstein, did K. Ruhl copyright the concept of the background? There are plenty of other bosses on this list who do that, but they're never ever compared to K. Rule. Regardless, Frederick goes there to attack DK, whereas Baron goes back there to hide. Frederick will go out of his way to try to move around erratically to avoid being hit by the penguin minion the player picks up, even ducking to the side to try to dodge on occasion. Baron just flies back and forth like a complete idiot, with the only reason it's hard to hit him being his extremely specific hitbox, where most of the time the cannonballs fall onto the ground and don't hit him. The Blunderbuss vs. Horn comparison is the most accurate one, besides the fact they're both fat animal kings, but it's largely just an aesthetic one. He fights very differently, primarily firing projectiles from above rather than horizontally, and even throwing in some of his own minions who scream in protest. 
It would be cool if K. Rule fired a clobber out of his blunderbuss instead of a generic barrel, if you want a comparison. Frederick has been said to lack personality, but in the extremely limited screen time he gets, by comparison to K. Rule, I don't think that's true at all. He changes his sides with his horn entirely just to taunt the player giving them a deep, throaty laugh. He gets angry and curses at DK when he gets frustrated. He also throws his weight around more than K. Rool ever did, with his obesity being a more relevant part of his character. K. Rool using his fat to attack was primarily a Smash Brothers development after Smash 4 had zero super heavyweight newcomers, with the only time he's done it before then being Donkey Kong 64. People have also said that the fact the arena is in lava means he's a generic Bowser clone. The entire reason the fight takes place in the volcano is to interact with his ice powers, making platforms temporarily become slippery and go back to normal. There's way more going on in this boss fight than any of K. Rules. Frederick is a legitimately challenging boss, and even after having watched his boss long before I ever played the game because I wanted to hate him, I found it extremely difficult to avoid his attacks. The attack where Frederick sends all the platforms into the air in particular is just nasty. I'd easily award him the hardest DK boss title. I've also seen people complaining this boss fight is too hard, but I think it's a very satisfying challenge in all the right places without being unfair at all. Now, you might be wondering, am I saying that K. Rool is somehow a worse character than Frederick because of all this? Obviously not. I'm ranking boss fights, not the characters as a whole. K. Rool has a massive history, and it's because of that history that he's gathered so many fans and managed to force his way into Smash Brothers against all odds. K. Rool is absolutely the better villain by comparison to Frederick and is a much more complicated character, but I can't say he has a better boss fight. The Frederick boss fight could have gone to K. Rool directly with no changes and people would have loved it, I assure you. Hopefully, K. Rool gets another great boss fight to top this one for me in the next game. He absolutely deserves it. K. Rool's last boss fight besides the terrible Pan one was in 1999 for crying out loud with Donkey Kong 64s. You're more than welcome to disagree with me on this boss fight as number one in the comments. But can we stop pretending it's some travesty? It seems like the fan hatred of Frederick is so prevalent that it might have even influenced Sakurai. Frederick is a novice spirit whose fight is against a white K. Rule, and no other Tropical Freeze boss has a spirit at all. Give Tropical Freeze a chance, guys. It's a fantastic game. It's one of the best 2D platformers ever made. Thank you so much for watching, it really means a lot. Let me know your own favorite and least favorite Donkey Kong bosses in the comments. Like and subscribe if you want to help me make more videos similar to this one, and give me ideas of what else you might like to see. I'm just starting out this channel, so seriously, every little bit helps, more than you know. Alternatively, dislike and report the video for hate speech if that's your thing.